and original. From Story Studio Network. Well, hello. Welcome in. Here we go. It's now and next. The flagship podcast for Story Studio Network. I'm Dave Trafford. I'm still getting used to this new cadence for the show. Yeah, well, we had a lot going on, so I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were still doing the show. Coming up with content that we find intriguing, and I think so do you. That's why you're here. But, uh, you know, going from four days a week to one day a week, it's it's a little, it's it's a funny thing, taking your foot off the pedal a little bit. So, (laughs) getting used to that a little bit. Uh, And that's okay. Because between this and On the Ledge, yeah, you know what? Two shows a week is uh, okay. We talk a lot to clients about cadence. And uh, many folks who do this, particularly those who are hosting and producing their own shows, we got a lot of creators in the stable. And they look at that, oh my, how could I possibly do a show a week? Uh, so anyway, I kind of take for granted what that means to most people. <laughs> but here we are. So we are going to actually uh, feature and highlight one of our hosts. And, um, well, mainly because it's it's the their series is completed. It's all there now. And it, we're going to uh, just to hear a little bit more, not only about the content of the podcast, but why it works for them. This is a non-profit organization. You know, they got to do their fundraising. They've got to get their sponsors, all that stuff. Sometimes a tough road to hoe, but they're out there doing it. And they have used the podcast effectively to tell their stories. There's so many that they have. So we'll get into that a little bit coming up. And uh, just to remind you that uh, we've got On the Ledger Ontario Politics podcast drops Fridays. It's a little late getting into the inbox because, uh, well, we wanted to change our schedule up a little bit. Inviting Tim Hudak onto the show. Tim is now the, the CEO at the Ontario Real Estate Association, and this has been Housing Week here, certainly in Ontario and across the country, both Queen's Park and Parliament Hill making significant housing commitments this week, we'll say, certainly uh, housing announcements, and we'll get Tim's perspective on that because it's one thing to talk about the housing crisis. And we talk about that in in a number of layers, right? Not the least of which is the supply. And Tim will tell you that supply will help with affordability. The better, more supply we have, it just means, you know, goes to reason that the prices would come down. Now, I I don't know, given the state of things here in uh, Toronto particularly, news this morning that, you know, Toronto housing is more expensive than it is in New York City. Okay, debate the numbers, however you want to look at it. Yeah, that's not something that's going to be turned back easily. And we also know that the housing targets are becoming out of reach. That is the build targets, right? So there's lots in there. But the feds have come up with some plans around financing, around mortgages. And, of course, Ontario has come up with its plans in terms of how it's going to light a fire under uh, the whole question of new housing developments. So we want to get Tim's perspective uh, on that, and we will do that. So I would encourage you to uh, flip over to On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast, and um, we want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a comment, please leave us one wherever you listen to the podcast. Otherwise, you can reach me on the social medias. Yeah, X, Threads, 
Although I'm, I'm you know, I kind of picked up on threads early on and mm, I don't know. Um, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm on all of them. At Dave Trafford. And uh, you'll find us there. And you'll also find this show. Uh, we've got a page specifically on the website. Story Studio Network slash now and next. So I think if you have to hyphenate the now hyphen and hyphen next. But anyway, it's there. If you want to check out the show there, as well as some of the other shows that uh, we are doing at Story Studio Network. All right, so housing will be one thing that we do want to talk about as we uh, move this thing forward. But there's also this other story around the LCBO and paper bags. And I got news for you. Everybody has missed the bloody point on that story. Okay, so I know everybody's cheering because Premier Ford stood up and said, the LCBO can no longer require you to buy a bag or make you, you know, have the reusable bags. We've got to go back to the paper because it's about affordability. And didn't even touch on the question of, you know, the whole premise of the ban on paper bags at LCBO based on their release back in August was that they were saving the environment. They're saving trees. That's a complete misunderstanding, exactly a misunderstanding of what the paper bag does, number one. Two, that Ford did not talk about it from, from the climate perspective is extraordinary because I'll tell you what, Two or three months from now, you're going to be looking up and you're going to be seeing mucky, cloudy, smoky skies again. We are going to have another fire season like we had last year, or maybe worse. And I know you're wondering, you're saying to yourself, Dave, what the hell's that got to do with a paper bag? Well, I'll tell you what. What it means is we have reduced the paper market by eliminating those paper bags. The paper market is already in decline because, well, we're not reading newspapers like we used to. We're reading them online, magazines, etc. A lot of that paper demand has gone away. And even if you did buy a newspaper, have you noticed how small the newspaper is now? I mean, it's barely as wide as your 13-inch screen on your computer. So the paper market is in significant decline. What's that got to do with it? Well, I'll tell you. Because we aren't using that unusable wood that goes into pulp and paper, it means it sits there. There's no market for it. It means that we aren't using the whole tree. And because we aren't using the whole tree, aren't salvaging as much out of the bush as we possibly can when we're harvesting, That stuff just sits around and it gets burned at best. So it's just kicking up emissions because we light it on fire. Or it just sits in the forest floor and creates tinder. And guess what lights on fire? (laughs) In a hurry. It's, It's poor forest management. The paper bag saves the climate, saves the planet because... You've cut down the tree and you've used wood that is no longer otherwise usable. You can't use it to build a house, but we can use it to make paper and paper bags. So to diminish the paper market in this country willfully is a mistake and is a complete misunderstanding. If you think that you are saving a tree by refusing to produce paper, You're not saving a tree. That tree's going to die at some point. It's going to fall down. It's going to rot. And it's going to turn into tinder in the bush. And it's going to contribute to the kind of fire season that we had last year here in Canada. Kicking out three times the carbon emissions. Last year alone, those fires kicked out three times the uh, the carbon emissions that came from exhaust pipes and chimneys burning fossil fuels in this country. No. Banning paper bags is not saving a tree. 
It's actually killing the planet. Don't believe me? You could look it up. Yeah, check out the web, the uh, website, or the actually the the podcast we're doing. Aaron and I have hosted a couple of seasons of uh, Canadian Forestry Can Save the World. I know, I know. You're going to tell me that you know. Well, right off the bat, it's a, it's got a uh, an agenda. Yeah, it does. It does. There's an agenda behind this. But listen to it, and tell me that it's that we're wrong. And I'm happy to have engage you in that conversation, right? It's not a commercial for the forestry industry. We are actually go into the science and we talk about the details and the hows and the whys and the wherefores and the need, the necessity to actually cut trees down to save the planet. That's how it works. So Canadian forestry can save the world. You can listen to that podcast probably right where you're listening to this one. is that all right that's cool all right uh one of the uh, shows that we are quite thrilled to be part of is a show that you know what it's something that you will identify with because somebody in your life lives with cancer has lived with cancer chances are it may have happened to you maybe you living with it you may have lost someone to cancer right and my dad went through that, 2018, cancer one. Um, and I, at the time, you know, and I'm still not sure that I don't want to do this, but I was thinking I'm going to make a an association, a group, and it's called Friends. Now remember, Friends United to Conquer and Kill Cancer. I think if you actually took the first letters there and bolded them, make a pretty good t-shirt yeah we're all here we're fuck cancer that's us and that's kind of how you know the approach that a lot of people take but how do you feel when that diagnosis comes along right it's one of those things that we hear people face all the time we're not surprised when people just generally statistically contract cancer but it's a whole new world and a whole new experience when you hear the diagnosis. So the show is called Facing Cancer Together, and it's hosted by Sue Larkin, and the organization that she leads is called Look Good, Feel Better. Facing cancer doesn't mean you are now only the cancer patient. So often we hear those with cancer share the need to feel seen, to feel understood, and not feel alone. So whether you are facing cancer yourself or supporting someone who is, join us. My name is Susan Larkin. We are Facing Cancer Together. So now there are 13 or so episodes of that show, and there are all kinds of incredible stories. And it was interesting, I sat down to talk to Sue about some of this stuff, and she said, you know, it's not until you get into that situation deeply, and you start to talk to the researchers, and you start to talk to the folks who are making such strides to fight cancer, to cure cancer, to beat cancer that you realize cancer is not one singular disease. And that's an important part of this discussion. We use this broad term, but it's actually up to 200 different Mm -hmm. illnesses. So breast, even within breast cancer, there's multiple types. And then you expand outside of breast and you've got all of these different types of cancer. So it's not you know, looking at one illness, it's looking at multiple illnesses. Yeah. I was talking to folks at the, uh, at the breast cancer uh, association last year, the national group, and they were making that very point and that, that Mm -hmm. this was the, this was more or less the, the community messaging that we're really going to have to understand that for all of the successes around the research and the treatments and beating cancer, 
What's happening as a result is they're discovering, to your point, oh, there's another strain. There's a different variety. There's something that we hadn't detected before. And the reason they're able to do that is because, you know, good fundraising, big organizations are, are really doing the heavy lifting on a lot of this stuff. And people are putting their running shoes on and going for the walks and runs, and that's really helping. But um, it, it, it makes your point how insidious this is. And I think you will know better than anybody given the work that you're doing, it'd be pretty hard to find somebody who hasn't been touched by breast cancer. You know, the stats, if I recall the most recent, uh, about one in every 2.4 Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And so, I mean, Dave, you mentioned off the top, you know, in my mind, I can think of, you know, four or five people in my personal life that have been impacted not just by breast, but by other cancers as well. And, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's twofold. There's there's the research to help find cures, to help find better treatments, but also taking care of the people that are going through treatment right now. Yeah. And, you know, that's at Look Good, Feel Better. That is that is what we are doing, not just for breast cancer, for people facing all cancers, because the research is, is extremely important. The medical treatment is extremely important, but so is what we call the psychosocial support. And there's a a ton of amazing groups. We're one of them that's really helping people with almost the mental health aspect of going through treatment. Yeah, my my dad went through it uh, in 2016 to 2018. And of course, he probably should have bought a lottery ticket based on the kind of cancer he had. He has this very rare bile duct cancer. And anyway, the the long and the short of it is... um, I realized going through that, as, as did the rest of the family, to your point, that um, all of a sudden the caregivers in the home need a whole lot more support than you might otherwise think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everybody around needs that support. There's the caregivers who are exhausted. There's the patient themselves. There's often, uh, you know, young children that can be involved. And then there are people that also need support that maybe don't have caregivers. Mm, mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, you know, I always, we were talking about this the other day, before I started working with Look Good, Feel Better, I realized I really had fallen into what I call the Hollywood version of, of cancer. You know, it's someone sitting in a Muskoka chair, drinking a cup of tea, looking wistfully at a body of water. And that's, that's just not what it is. People are still needing to work sometimes as they go through treatment. People are still needing to look after kids. People are having caregivers, but then they're trying to look after the caregivers. It's a, it's a full, you know, I don't know too many people who sit on that Muskoka chair and look wistfully out on the water. Well, you touched on one part of it, and I, and I realized I was lucky enough to have an employer who was supportive of me supporting my mom, supporting my dad, right? And, yeah. and, and, and they, it meant for me, in many cases, like a four-hour drive down the 401 to go and make sure that I would spend a few days with them to get him to his treatments and all of those sorts of things. And so it, it didn't occur to me until then that, wow, this really does spread into the workplace, into the economy. There's all of that um, sort of soft stats that we don't really think of. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, David, like you, I live, I live, kind of downtown Toronto. Uh, you know, I know when my my uncle was going through treatment, the appointments, you know, it was a drive down from Aurora on the DVP. That can be a couple hours. Mm-hmm. I've talked to folks, you know, in, in um, I was out in Saskatchewan two year, uh, last year and in this tiny, tiny little town, you know, like just an intersection essentially. And people were driving to Regina two hours every day to get their treatment. And the community just rallies. You know, they set up a chart, who can drive on this day. And sometimes the treatments are short. You might be driving for two hours to get a 15, 20 minute treatment. And then you head back. It's, it's the logistics, the like, it's like you need a a logistics officer from from the military sometimes, I think, to get through all of the appointments. Yeah. and, And I mean, we can go off on a tangent about the healthcare supports and whether or not it's a universal system. And maybe we'll save that yeah. for another show because I really do want to get into what you guys are doing at Look Good, Feel yeah. Better. And, and I, I remember hearing about this working in the newsrooms. I don't know. It, it, it's got to be 15, 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, just give me the, the origin story here because it's yeah. really important, I think. 
Yeah. So we started in Canada uh, just over 30 years ago, about 31 years ago now. And there were two groups. There was a group of medical professionals who started saying, hey, there's something here when people, and at the time women, going through treatment don't feel like themselves. There's a mental health impact on this. And at the same time, there was a... um a movement within the beauty industry and the skincare and cosmetics industry because there had been a look good, feel better that started down in the U.S. And so these groups kind of slowly realized they were doing the same work and that's how we launched in Canada. And so look good, feel better actually exists in 27 countries around the world. We're independent here in Canada, but we share best practices with our global partners. And it's fabulous because we can learn what's going on. And so we started at Princess Margaret, we started in Montreal, and then we just grew from there. And we are in hospitals and cancer centers, uh, Canadian Cancer Society lodges, different cancer support uh, groups. In uh, Just before COVID, we were in 100 sites across the country. We're just slowly reopening all of those. So we'll be back there by the end of the year. Um, and then, of course, we also offer our workshops online as well. And and t- when you t- talk about those t- sort of two lanes, one was yeah. more or less a medical mental health side of things. The other one was about, you know, what we probably didn't use the phrase 30 years ago, but body image. Mm-hmm. And, right. I mean, and that was the whole sense of it. And I'm, and I'll tell the, the, the audience when we sat down to talk about the specifics of the show that you guys are producing, um, the number one concern for the you know, question, I guess, that women had, particularly in this case, um, when they were given a diagnosis was not necessarily uh, about prognosis, about treatment, about anything else. It was, am I going to lose my hair? Mm -hmm. And and, and, and on the surface, it sounds so trivial. But when we talked about it, it became very deeply rooted. And often women are so embarrassed to say they're worried about that because they feel like it's vanity. I hear I have this cancer diagnosis. I'm like... But it actually comes, so just uh, for your listeners, so at the workshop, we teach about using skincare, color cosmetics, and wigs and head coverings to help you feel like yourself again. And I always clarify, this isn't a beauty session. This isn't a makeover. This isn't getting makeup done for your wedding. This is where we teach you how to draw in brows that have maybe disappeared, eyelashes, how to manage hair loss. and we teach this so that women can choose what feels right for them. We never say you have to wear a wig. We never say you must do this. It's teaching them the skills to make their own decisions. And there's kind of two parts to the workshop. So on the surface, as I call it, it's around looking in the mirror and seeing yourself. And that comes down to two things. There's uh, identity. So many times when you become Uh, diagnosed with cancer, all of a sudden, you're no longer, I'm not Sue anymore. I'm the cancer patient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I look in the mirror, and I see that reflected back, that is not how I want to see myself. And that's not necessarily how I want to be seen. And so for a lot of women, maybe they're still working, they're picking up kids from school. And what they want to do is just look like them. We had... um, a story a couple of years ago, uh, last year, one of our CEO was popped into this restaurant and she'd been going there quite a bit during COVID to support this local restaurant. And she started chatting with the owner and it turned out she was just celebrating her five year anniversary of being cancer free. And Dee said, oh, I work, you know, I work for this organization, look good, feel better. This woman got tears in her eyes and she said, I did that workshop. I did it five years ago. She still has the picture on her phone of her leaving the workshop. She said it was the only fun thing that happened to me during cancer. But the reason she signed up for it is her daughter was graduating from high school. And she wanted to go to her daughter's graduation. And she wanted it to be about her daughter. She didn't want it to be about her daughter's mom who had cancer. So she wanted to show up at that graduation ceremony and party looking like herself, not looking like someone um, who was going through cancer treatment because she wanted the focus to be on her daughter. Yeah. And I, and I say this without being cynical or, or, or disrespectful, but if, you know, quite frankly, if, if I lose the rest of my hair 
as a result, nobody's really, I, honestly, if a no. guy loses his hair, it's not going to be as big a deal as it is in terms of how, if, if you lost your hair and how you would see yourself. So there's a Absolutely. real, you know, gender issue there that we got to kind of take into account. Though, you know, it's interesting, Dave. So just last year, we we talked to our friends at the UK, Look Good, Feel Better in the UK. They have a workshop for men. And so we actually started one online last year. And you're right. A lot of the guys who join the workshop, they're in their 50s. Few of them have, you know, robust hairlines at this point. But you'd be shocked at, um, because there's a lot of changes during treatment to your skin. Uh. It gets excessively dry, excessively dry. And a lot of men, especially kind of in that 50-year-old plus age range, might not have really thought about skin care. So they don't know about gentle cleansers, moisturizing, using sunscreen. And we also talk, there's a, there's a, a, a point in both uh, workshops where we talk about hygiene because, of course, your immune system is compromised during treatment. So for women, we talk about uh, not using makeup brushes, disposable applicators, all of this. For men, we talk about how to s- shave safely because you don't want to get nicks and scratches during treatment because you could potentially get an infection. And then we actually do a little bit of a BB cream, which is like a very light foundation, and we show the men how to draw in their brows because a lot of them don't really see what that impact of the brows would be. So the hair loss isn't as big a thing, but the um, dry skin and, and the brows and lashes is, is, is something they're really... And they actually love this BB cream because you can get a lot of dark circles. You can get a lot of, of skin changes that are quite visible. So, and as we, we talked about that and, and sort of the range of the conversation that you guys have had over the last 30 years, your peripheral vision has expanded. I mean, yeah. we're not, and I, and I say this again, we're, you're not just focusing on a very specific targeted group about, you know, looking and presenting as themselves. It sounds to me like you've actually kind of followed that narrative down the line and said, okay, the, these are the ancillary issues that we need to deal with. That in fact, the cancer patient is only ground zero in our discussion, mm-hmm. that there is family, that there is caregivers. How does that present for, for your group? Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, in a way, when I talk about the the psychosocial support that happens in the workshop, and so the workshop, whether it's online or in person, we keep the numbers small. It's usually between t- four to 20 people, depending on the size of the room and, and online. And the reason we do that is it allows for conversation. And so what we've learned over the years is it no matter how supportive your supportive network is, they just don't get it, Mm. even though they want to. They might logically. And if you think about life stages that we go through, you typically, most people will have someone in their world that's going through something similar, whether it's graduating high school, whether it's getting married, having a baby. There's somebody in your space that you that that you know is in that same stage with you. And what happens with a cancer diagnosis is th- that natural group is almost gone. You're the only one going through it. And as as much as your friends and family can empathize, they just don't understand, you know, right now, you know, I'm in my late 40s, you know, if I get together with my friends, we talk about teenagers and we talk about perimenopause because that's what we're going through. And just hearing my friends say, oh, yeah, that happens to me too. That makes me feel better. And so that's the same thing that happens in the workshop. So someone will say, oh, my gosh, are you on this meds? Are you getting these hot flashes? Or this is this happening to you? And someone says, oh, I hear you. And this is, you know, I discovered I tried this, I tried that. And it's this kind of uh, unofficial support moments that happen. We have women who leave the workshop and they've now become a best friend. They they go to appointments with each other and they celebrate. There was um uh, one of my favorite stories. I was at a workshop out in Halifax and there was 12 women around the room and there was one woman, she hadn't started treatment yet. She was coming early because she wanted to learn everything before she started treatment. So she still had a full head of beautiful, beautiful hair. And throughout the workshop, she was 
tearing. I don't want to say she was crying, but she's, you know, kind of looking up at the ceiling so the tears go back in her eyes rather than down her cheeks because she's she's scared because she doesn't know what to expect. It's a very high stress time right before treatment starts because it's this anticipation, right? It's really high stress. There's another woman in the workshop. She's about three months into treatment and she's rocking a bald head. She's got a scarf on. And we're talking about wigs. And one of the things with synthetic wigs is if you um, are cooking, you want to take your wig off because the synthetic ends can melt a little bit. So especially if you're barbecuing or opening an oven, you don't want to be wearing your wig. Well, this woman, and I mean, she's Halifax. She's she's East Coast, amazing sense of humor, big personality. She goes, oh, ladies, that happened to me. I didn't take my wig off. I opened the oven door and guess what? I melted the ends of my wig, but it's okay because I hadn't named my wig yet. So I <laughs> named my wig biscuits because that's what I was taking out of the oven. And everyone, just like you, yeah. everyone around the table, like these women are going through crap, right? Yeah. They've got cancer. The room bursts out laughing. And this woman who had been fighting tears the entire workshop started laughing. And she said, if this woman can get through this with humor, then I think I can get through it too. And her, this woman, her sister was there with her and her sister is supporting and her sister's driving her appointments and all this stuff. But her sister can't crack a joke about the wig name Biscuits of and course. make her laugh. Of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 No. It's one of my favorite stories. Thank you for indulging. It was well, a long no, but one. That, it was, but it, but it kind of gets to the point that that's, that's part of this personal journey. And it, and it yeah. really is about these moments that you're going to face and, and the importance of identifying with, with community. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's Absolutely. really what it, what it comes down to. And this is for me why, you know, for the podcast, you know, one of the things we really worked on was to make sure we were bringing real voices, real stories, you know, people just telling it like it is, because I often think of people that maybe don't have a support network, yeah. maybe don't. And if, if, you know, for me, if someone listens to one of the podcast episodes and says, I feel better after hearing that person's experience. I might try that. To me, it's just that moment of I'm not alone. I'm not, it's not just me. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, the whole point of the podcast medium is about community. So I think you guys are really in the right place for this. Um, not that you're biased or anything. No, well, I, 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 you know, <laughs> but what I, I do too. I, I, I do I, too. And I say that in terms of just overall, if you want to create community and you want to touch community, this is that's a good way to do it. Yeah. Right? Um, and 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 so I think that that it'll be I'll be interested to hear how your community and that extended network mm -hmm. responds to that because mm -hmm. there's there's more than an educational tool here for you. Exactly. Right. It, exactly. Um, it, it's, I, I hesitate to call it therapeutic, but there is a salve about this that isn't going to cure cancer. Nope. Right. But, but it, you know, to your point, Dave, about our system and the, and the impact, you know, for me, if somebody, there is an impact. The, if the idea is when people, uh, you know, come out the other side of their treatment, if they have been supported physically and emotionally and mentally, mm -hmm. it's better for them. Oh. It's better for their caregivers yeah. and it's better for the community. It's better for all of us. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, I just love it. Well, I, I just love it. Draw the curtain back here as we're talking. My Slack channel's buzzing over here on the other screen. And uh, our producer, Mike Trudler, has been hard at work uh, working with you guys on this show. And he has uh, packaged up your trailer. So Excellent. So it should be in your inbox presently. And uh, so, uh, and uh, the, the good news is, I got a note from Aaron. I love the trailer. It's going to be great. So, um, and, and the whole point of this is the show is called, you know, Facing Cancer Together. Yeah. And I, it's, um, I wish I had, or I wish my mom had kind of had the opportunity to, to take advantage of this when she was going through with my dad. Yeah. You know? Um, and in fact, it, it probably wouldn't be bad for those surviving folks to be able to listen to this because there, there is a lot in here that, um, personalizes the experience, but also to your point, gives you some sense of support, 
community yeah. feeling like you're not alone. And there's a lot of good practical information in there too. That's, you know, it's kind of what I love about our our both our workshop. We've got some other uh, speaker series that we do and the podcast. It's really that both. It's giving some practical information like don't wear your synthetic wig when you open the oven, as well as that psychosocial, that emotional support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because both are really important. So um, there will be all kinds of noise this month around fundraising, around cancer. Uh, and I don't say that in a derogatory way. I just think that this is the month that we really hear about it. How can mm -hmm. we How can we help you guys? Oh, well, lgfb.ca is our website. And first of all, if anyone knows someone going through cancer, we always say to family and friends, one more thing you can do is say to your loved one, sign up for the workshop. Let me register you. I'll drive you to the appointment or I'll help you log on to the Zoom and just spread the word because nothing, oh, there's, you know, when someone says, oh, I went through treatment or my mom went through treatment and I didn't know about your workshop, it breaks my heart. I want to know that everyone out there who wants to join us knows about it. And of course, our workshops are complimentary. So it's it's free for everyone to attend. Uh, people get a beautiful product, a bag of, of skincare and cosmetic kits that are all donated by the industry. But of course, it takes funding to, to run these workshops. And so go to lgfb.ca, you can make a donation or you can sign someone up or do both. And uh, if anyone out there listening is a makeup artist or an esthetician or a wig specialist, we are also always looking for volunteers because our workshops, I have about a thousand volunteers across the country who run these workshops and they are incredible uh, giving and kind people. So it's a, it's a wonderful team to be part of. So sign let someone you know facing cancer know about the workshop. If you've got the skill set and the time, volunteer, and donations are always welcome. You know, I was just reading today about inflation, of course, is a huge topic. And for the not-for-profit sector, not just look good, feel better, you know, we, we get hit with all of these increases in expenses. You know, our, our shippings go up. We, you know, obviously we need to pay our staff a living wage. Um, so everything goes up for us. But when your services are free, your revenue generation, you, you know, you, we are dependent on donations from individuals and companies. The kindness of others. So, the kindness of indeed, others. Indeed. So it is lgfb.ca is the website. Sue Larkin is the uh, Chief Operations Officer at Look Good, Feel Better. Sue, thanks. Thank you, Dave. Facing Cancer Together. Yep. Susan Larkin is the host there. And... Um, it, it's one of those shows that we're just happy to be a part of at Story Studio Network. And we do, uh, you know, a fair amount of that kind of mission-driven programming where we sit down and we talk about the shows or talk about the issues that, you know, affect you. And they're not always, you know, this one particularly is medical. I talked about the forestry show. Um, we did a great series on cybersecurity. Right. With the folks at Coding for Veterans, the need to have cyber hygiene, I think, is the phrase that comes up. But there's also the uh, the great work that's being done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I get to work with Sarah Thorne on engineering with nature. We're into our seventh season of that series. And it's a crazy, you know, you talk about the climate. There's where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is using natural and nature based solutions to deal with problems we face because of a changing climate. They're using nature itself to protect nature. It's a really fascinating, fun kind of thing to look at. So, um, And, you know, we're, we're working on new shows uh, all the time. I think right now we got like nine active shows. So skip on over, would you, to storystudionetwork.com. And uh, everybody loves the website. It's kind of a cool experience if you haven't been there yet already. But if it's something that, you know, you need a story that needs to be told. And it needs to be told the way Sue is telling the stories at Look Good, Feel Better. It's the way the stories are being told at the Daily Bread Food Bank with Neil Hetherington and his team on the 2030 Project. 
Or maybe you're a thought leader or a business leader, and you've got something to say about the work that you do. You know, Lauren Goldstein is the biz doctor, and she works with us at Story Studio Network. So there's a wide range of subjects and opportunities there for you to use that podcast medium in your marketing, your branding strategy. And it's a way to tell stories and put stories out in front of people that generally, you know, the above the fold legacy media doesn't allow for. And it's just, that's not a criticism. That's just not their jam. It's not what they do. They wouldn't do this, right? Generally speaking, there's no room for this kind of storytelling, this kind of conversation, generally on mainstream, and I hate to call it mainstream, this is mainstream media, but it's more legacy media, broadcast media, etc. So, uh, but one show that I would point you to, Why Meaning Matters, have a listen to that one. Those are 15 minute shows, give or take, the mostest, funnest thing you'll listen to in a long time because they get dig down to the culture that you live in and how you shape culture based on your sense of an understanding of the meaning of fill in the blank, the meaning of kids' sports. I know it sounds small, but dig in and you find out how that shapes culture, the meaning of superheroes. Yeah, they, they talk about that stuff too. So it's fun. Why Meaning Matters. All these shows are on our website. It's storystudionetwork.com. So I would uh, appreciate it. Again, if you've got something to say, something to do, something to think about, something to say or ask about, comment on. Uh, leave it wherever you listen to the podcast. Or again, find me on social media at Dave Trafford. And that finds me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, Threads. And, uh, oh, yeah, over on LinkedIn. And just a reminder, if you haven't done so already, check out this week's edition of On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast. And the bulk of what we're going to talk about is housing. We'll get into other things, some polling at um, the provincial level and uh, what that means for Doug Ford and the newly minted Bonnie Crombie as leader of the Liberal Party. And, you know, the struggles that Merritt Stiles is having as the NDP leader. She should be running the table here, but for whatever reason, she's not. And Tim Hudak will be our guest, is our guest on On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast, all for Story Studio Network. Now and next is Story Studio Network's flagship podcast, produced by our chief executive producer, Dave Trafford, and supported by our entire SSN team, including our senior producers, Becky Coles and Jen Hudson, our technical producer and audio editor, Mike Trutler, Jamie Nickerson is our production manager, and our sonic logo designer is Greg McDonald. Also, I'm Aaron Trafford, <laughs> queen of the universe. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.